Hello, everybody. Welcome to a brand new episode of our weekly hangouts about Bitcoin, blockchain, money, and more. My co-hosts are Patrick van Zuiden of BitcoinColdStars.com and Tim Pastoor, co-founder of Identity. Uh, Identify. Our guest today is Preston Byrne, uh, CEO of Ares Industries. We'll talk about his open source blockchain tech company and his rare passion for a lovely creature, the Marmots. Hi, Preston. Um, welcome. Hey, good to be here. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah. So first of all, tell us a bit more about your passion for marmots before before we start talking about the more serious stuff afterwards. Yeah. So basically, um, we have marmots in, in Connecticut where I grew up, and they're a pest, and they dig holes in your lawn. Um, and my parents attempted when I was much younger. They're like, well, get rid of them, do something about them. And I really couldn't because they're just these cute, fat, stupid, adorable critters. And um, and so when we were trying to explain quantum mechanics and quantum physics uh, concepts with one of my co-founders uh, when when back in the day before Eris was actually a thing, um, we were he was rather communicating to me uh, how you would get a qubit piece of information that's quantized from A to B. And basically he's like, okay, so imagine you're trying to give a cookie to a marmot and the cookie is the bit and you know, you're know you sending the information and the marmot is the recipient. Um, that then spun wildly out of control uh, just because it was hilarious. I wrote an article featuring marmots just because it's a good way to, if you're it was criticizing a particular project. Um, and so I had a lot of marmots in it because that kind of blunts it a bit and makes it funny and not quite as harsh. Um, and then we just kind of ran with it, and it became the company's logo because it was funny and it wasn't over serious, and we didn't want to be overly serious as a crypto startup. Um, so yeah, it's you know our mascot is a fat squirrel. There's not much more to it than that, other than we really like fat squirrels. So <laughs> okay, well I guess if you want to engage with um, with the type of companies you want to work with, you do have to be overly serious sometimes. Or, or are your clients so all fine with the whole marmot um, joking around all day? Uh, one one bank actually gave me a marmot cuddly toy um, a couple of weeks ago. So. Okay, so that's um, they're not not necessarily a client, but uh, no. One bank gave me a marmot cuddly toy. They're like, oh, we see you really like marmots on Twitter, so we we got we got one for you. And I was like, that is like this is the best bank ever. And occasionally you'll see, actually quite often on the website, uh, one of the links. It's like you know, learn more about you know tech, tech, tech. And then the bottom button is learn more about cuddly marmots. And like invariably, you will see the stuffiest banks in the world, which have you know very serious reputations. And the sort of visitor path will go Eris Industries Maine, and then learn more about cuddly marmots. Click, and then they'll go to marmots.org, which is a Canadian charity that that works with a, a an endangered species of marmot known as the Vancouver Island marmot. So, um, so you see, bankers are much sweeter than people uh, give them credit for. Yeah, I think I think people. It's a very startup thing to do, like yeah. to just have something silly like that, and it makes it uh, it makes it fun and keeps us uh, it keeps us down to earth, like. You know, we're not running around going, you know, you know, world changing this that. It's you know, we have technology and we like squirrels. So, okay. <laughs> that, so that's what, what does your company Ares do, and and should an average Bitcoin user care? I think well, they certainly should, um, in the sense that um, I, I think they should. I think the average Bitcoin user should care, um, but not how to put it. So there's been a lot of discussion, as, as they say, much digital ink has been spilled lately of this blockchain versus Bitcoin discussion um, or blockchain without Bitcoin discussion. And the fact is when, when, when we talk about the blockchain and when the banks talk about the blockchain and when a lot of people talk about the blockchain, they're not necessarily talking about a cryptocurrency. What they're talking about is a distributed database that has some of the qualities of Bitcoin. Um, that they liked, which then they think could be adapted to serve a commercial purpose um, or some other social purpose or whatever purpose, um, whatever purpose they needed to serve. So what we did is a couple of years ago we were we were designing applications on Ethereum about a year and a bit ago. So the three of us and also our two first core devs, that's Ethan and Andreas, and we realized that as you increase the level of complexity in your application. Um, the amount of things that can go wrong also increases commensurately. So how do you fix that? And the answer is you kind of have to take this idea of the global decentralized blockchain and then kind of pare it in a little bit and say, okay, well, your blockchain is now going to be a distributed database, but you're going to have permissions so that you can control who's interacting with it, you can control the kind of attack vectors that there are, and you can control what permissions people have. 
um, with the decentralized chains, the reason that you have a cryptocurrency attached is because the, how to put it, the security considerations are game theoretic. It's about people competing with each other with an objective outside source of expenditure and then some kind of reward which is exchangeable. But in your usual database or software development paradigms, people don't use databases because, you know, because they're printing money for them or they don't use databases because they're not under someone's control. They use databases because they're a tool which they can control, they or a group of other people, to accomplish a very specific objective. So what our view of a blockchain is, is we think it's a particularly interesting type of distributed database um, which is very good at serving as a kind of distributed infrastructure. Um, and once you take the view that a blockchain is amenable to being controlled by someone or by some group, and so this doesn't mean like, you know, people say, well, private blockchains, it means, you know, there's going to be a giant bank chain or U.S. gov chain, and we don't think that's quite quite correct. We think it's something like a couple of, uh, a couple of guys, rather like us at Eris Industries, don't want to pay GitHub for a private repo. So what we do is we write GitHub or we write Git on a on a blockchain, distribute that blockchain around, and then we have that global utility where we're all verifiably connected to one another in a very, you know, in a very reliable and fault tolerant way, but we're not actually paying someone else to do it. We're using the substantial amount of hard drive space that we all have and processing power that we all have that we're not using in order to administer this application and not be reliant on some other third party to do it for us. So, so much. So, so let, let's, let's make this a bit more tangible. So on your website, you have this uh, very cool animated video uh, yep. about this fictional character called Sumon, yep. who works at the land registry office in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Yep. Uh, so use this example, please, then, to illustrate how areas would work in practice and also um, how it would compare to, let's say, if Bitcoin was used in this instance, and especially cover things like proof of work, tokens, redundancy, speed, permissions, just sort of make this example clear you, while using your technology. Well, I think, sorry, I'm just readjusting in my seat here. I think we should start with Bitcoin, actually, because Bitcoin was the first, and it's the one that everyone understands the best. So if we, let's say we just clone Bitcoin, and we create Bitcoin 2 tomorrow, and we just look at it for what it is. It doesn't have a network effect, so we know that. Um, its security will be low because of mining and things like that. But let's say we then distribute it out among 6,000 users and just totally arbitrary data, and then we say users just start using the chain. Assume everyone is trustworthy, so they're just using it as a data transfer mechanism. What you have when you don't have a currency idea attached to it is you have a distributed database where you can take out any large chunks of the network at any given time, and the network will continue running more or less uninterrupted without a central server or some leader which has been elected processing those transactions. So the people who are working on mining, on solving the blocks, they're sitting there and they're going, okay, we're just honestly processing transactions that we're getting from everybody else. Now, if you look at it that way, what you've actually got is a clearing and settlement system, which you have now established at almost nil cost. And we say nil cost because what you've done is you've said this is the clearing and settlement architecture for this arbitrary unit, Bitcoin 2, that we've just set up. And if you talk to a cryptocurrency guy, they're like, well, why would you want that? And I think the answer is because you've just taken 2,000 personal computers and you've created a clearing and settlement architecture that would normally cost tens of millions of dollars to implement. Um, so that kind of a data infrastructure, if you can control it and if you can control who's accessing it and what they're doing with it, can actually be very useful to a group of people who are looking to set up data interconnectivity without a central server somewhere. Um, where they all have transparent views of how that system is supposed to work. So what we did is we started with the Ethereum blockchain um, as our starting point because of its smart contract capabilities. And what we did is we kind of started to gut it uh, in the sense that if you have a blockchain which is usually hard-coded to a client, we said the blockchain should be self-defining with the smart contracts themselves. So if you can imagine... Um, if you can imagine putting a bunch of controls in your Genesis block, a brake pedal, a, you know, a gas pedal, a steering wheel, your indicators, everything that you need to run a blockchain, you can express that as scripts, smart contracts, which are unlocked by a particular key with a particular user who has a right to access that permission. And once you have those smart contracts in the Genesis block, as long as you're you know, defining the blockchain, why not define all kinds of other permissions as well? For example, when someone adds a block, you can check and see, 
all right, well, in this blockchain, we're only going to allow nodes 1 through 100 to add blocks. So if then node 202 decides they're going to add a block, when they attempt to propagate that transaction to the network, the validating nodes who are being run by whoever you know, is administering this chain will not accept that block. And so consensus will say, no, these guys are the ones who are determining this. The rest of us who are using this network follow their lead. You, node 202, have attempted to add a block. We don't recognize that instruction is valid because this rule book we put in the Genesis block determines everything that can happen afterwards. So, so let's so, go back to Dark Bangladesh then and to, to use this, um, this mechanism. Yep. So if we go back to Dhaka Bangladesh, um, let's start with Bitcoin and work our way up. With Bitcoin, you've got a write permission. That write permission is you can send a balance which is associated with your particular account to another key pair, another address. So your permission is I have a number and I can amend this database in favor of somebody, somebody else by signing a transaction, digital signature, and then it gets moved over to them. So any unspent output I have, I can assign to a new user. That's just a write permission. You can do the same thing and apply the same principle to something like a like button on Facebook. If you wanted a, you know, let's say you had like, you know, like chain, just for the sake of argument, where people could like things. Yeah. So, say, so in this case, would be, for example, with Bitcoin, it could be a colored coin that would represent a certain property in Bangladesh that could be transferred from uh, address A to address B? Not quite. I think what you have to sort of, Bitcoin is a bit two-dimensional compared to smart contracts. Smart contracts, everything is a script. So you can have multiple properties expressed in what that script is. So if you were dealing with something like a land plot, what would you have? You would have a, a script which would represent the land plot it would show who owns the land plot, i.e. who is able to dispose of that piece of land to somebody else, what conditions have to be satisfied before a disposal takes place. For example, a, any liens which are associated with, for example, a, a, a mortgage or some other type of charge, those have to be discharged first. All taxes have to be paid. Um, you know, any disputes over the transfer can't be registered. So you're expressing things in a much more complex way than simply just saying, I'm moving a coin from A to B. What you actually have is a script which contains multiple permissions for multiple different users and it lives in a context which is the system in which it lives. So, so basically, to, to describe it, how to put it, it, it looks kind of, it looks and feels like a web application and it's designed to act like a web application but what it does and what it means is in the context of the whole, you know, the whole context in which a system is designed to operate. Um, so, so how, to, how to best solve it then with Bitcoin, before we go to how, how Aris would uh, solve this, so if we stick to Bitcoin Bangladesh, so uh, what, how would you um, go about solving that particular uh, problem in Bangladesh with Bitcoin? I don't think I would, um, to be honest with you. But let's say you're forced to do it, so what would you do? Uh, with Bitcoin, what would I do? It depends on what problem you're trying to fix. If you're simply dealing with something like, I want to establish ownership to a piece of land, then you met a protocol. Um, and you have a token which represents the ownership alone. So a counterparty, uh, for example, you would... So a counterparty, something like that, a colored coin, open assets, and anything like that would do. But if you want to do something like, let's say I assign someone a token, I say, here you go, here's your token. All right, I've got this token. But then I go and borrow against the land, so there's an interest in favor of a mortgagor. Um, am I assigning him the token again? You know, give it to the mortgagor, and then he has to give it back to me? No, what you want to do is I want to hold the token and I want to say, I'm the owner of this land, I'm beneficially entitled to it, but I can't actually transfer it until the mortgagor, or the mortgagee rather, says, I'm going to release the obligation of the landowner because he's paid off the mortgage. So let's say you've got a landowner in a bank, you have to have some way for there to be if this then that logic which relates to a particular plot of land. Bitcoin can't necessarily do that. Um, whereas a smart contract conceivably can really do anything that you can write in code. Um, so you can write very complex applications. One we did was called the People's Republic of Doug, or rather one of, one of our core devs did last year, and that was an entire state. That was a central bank. It was land plots. Um, it had some you know, mining functionality built in. It's all kinds of stuff. And so from our perspective, if you want to get those more complex relationships in, you have to start moving back to a more traditional software architecture rather than something which is Bitcoin-based, and that almost invariably means that you have to use smart contracts instead of tokens. And so, right, and again, then, if we uh, now focus on Ares in this particular example, um, how would the, the blockchain look like and who would have read access to the blockchain? 
Would it be like all people in Bangladesh, or would it be transparent to the whole world? How would you uh, how would you design it? It depends on what you're trying to do. I mean, blockchains are. So what we've done with the blockchain is we've ensured that you can control write access. The problem is there's no real way to control read access. So once you've got a copy of it, you can see it. Um, it's conceivable that you might have applications where you're just going to want a blockchain run on a VPN in the sense that you have disparate offices who need to be coordinating with one another, but you don't necessarily want to use a mainframe in order to get them to talk to each other, or you don't have reliable enough access to go get to a cloud. So what you'll do is you'll just hand someone a copy of a blockchain, and it's best thought of as a rule book, and say this data-driven process, as expressed by this blockchain, you're now signing on to it, and they can then communicate with you, and they know that when they're communicating with you, that their communications are getting through if they see it getting in integrated into a block. And you know, let's say on the opposite side of the country, that when they're communicating with you, as long as you've got that transaction which has been signed by their private key, it came from them. So it's kind of a really low-cost way to consistently record the history of interactions between a very wide range of people. Um, where are we going with that? Where were we going with that? <laughs> no, that's the sort of the, 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 so the, Eris, Eris is a template, right? It's, yeah. it's so totally what about um, Honduras? Uh, I think Factum, which is using Bitcoin, is going to help Honduras with their land registry. Um, but earlier you said you would not use Bitcoin um, to to do something like that. So uh, what do you what do you think of that uh, approach then taking uh, in by Honduras? Well, it depends on what they're trying to do. I mean, if if Factum is trying to just record that doc if they're just trying to record documents and say, right, we've got this hash of a document and then a hash of a hash goes into Bitcoin and we've checkpointed it and you've got this proof of existence thing, that's fine, you know, if that's what you want to do. If you're trying to do sort of event logic and you're trying to control access for a lot of users and say, well, this database reflects the current state of ownership, um, I I don't see how that particular system, it might be able to verify that documents are going in, and that's a useful service. Verif and then you have all of the access controls and all of the transfer of title being done at the land registry itself. So, so your, your solution is basically smarter because there's more, more possible is what you're saying. Well, I wouldn't want to talk down factum, but I mean, I think it's, Eris is, a, Eris is a blank template, right? The blockchain design we have is blank. It is, you know, when you create a blockchain and you bring it into the world, it sits there, it looks up at you, and it goes, what the fuck am I here for? What am I supposed to I'm do? I'm swearing in the show. Oh, pardon me, pardon me. What, what, am I, what am I supposed to do? What is my purpose in life? And you go, well, little blockchain, you can be whatever you want. And the blockchain goes, okay, well, program me. And then you program it, and you tell it what to do. So it's on the one hand, it's a database. On the other hand, it's an application. And so it is an application which has its own history recorded in itself, where what has happened determines what can happen. In this view, Bitcoin is an application. It is a money transfer application for Bitcoins. That is what it is. A land registry application would be a land registry application where you program in all of the relevant requirements that you need to run a land registry. Similarly, for any other type of application, you start with this blank template, and then you just say, blockchain, you're going to be my infrastructure. Once I'm done programming you and telling you exactly what I need you to do, um, and the benefit of having it in smart contracts is that you can change all of that over time, which you can't do when you've got all of your blockchain logic hard-coded in. So for us, this is something which is designed to be reproduced many millions of times. Um, there's no cryptocurrency involved. Uh, it will never cost money to use it, um, and it never should. Um, and it's, it's free and open source. So it's just this idea that the blockchain is itself a useful tool. Um, to distribute application logic and get people working together consistently. But Patrick, I believe you had a few questions. Um, you're still mute, by the way. So. Oh. Mm. No, I'm. Yes, here yes. I am again. Uh, well, yeah, Preston. Uh, I am asking what kind of applications are best fitted for Iris. It really depends. It really depends on who you're talking to. Um, I mean, someone will say, well, what's the best application for a bank? Um, you know, HSBC will be very different from Commonwealth Bank of Australia. Um, they will both have very different profiles and very different, or, you know, very different considerations in how their organizations need to improve and which it, what is inefficient within their organizations and where you might want to start putting a blockchain in. I think generally, um, things like securities clearing and settlement, uh, people could potentially build applications which run that kind of logic on it. 
we, for the moment, have been focusing primarily on non-financial applications. One of our first ones was a distributed YouTube that we built. We call it Together. So um, anyone familiar with Alexandria, uh, Together and Alexandria came out roughly about the same time. And so Together runs on an RSDB, uh, which is the back-end application logic. And RSDB holds both the permissions to access Together, but also it holds pointers to IPFS, the Distributed File Storage Network. So what you can do is you can set up a distributed YouTube-type application. We've also, I think, got a um, the Blockchain Info API, also part of the application. So you can tip people in Bitcoin for videos that you like, and then you can upload videos onto a distributed network and control who sees what, simply because, and it's all run on a blockchain rather than being run on, you know, run out of a server somewhere. And so for us, this is really to demonstrate anything that you can do on the web you can now do on a blockchain. The critical difference is once you're doing it on a blockchain, you're simply taking it out of the public internet, taking it off of a server, moving it onto a network potentially that you don't want other people to see or that you don't want other people to know about or that you just need a secure permissions layer where you need to know that the people who are interacting with that network are only the people who are authorized to interact with that network on the terms on which they've been so authorized. So, I mean, financial applications really, any anything is fair game. Um, really any kind of communications infrastructure where you're coordinating between large groups of people, uh, medical records, particularly in transferring medical records, identity in terms of expressing identity and then being able to port identity. So if you have a format for one type, if you, let's say you have a world citizenship project or something Chris Ellis has been working on for some time, and let's say you have an identity record which you start generating in a refugee camp um, with, multiple, uh, with multiple data points, biometric or otherwise, for someone who's living in South Sudan, and then they have medical records which are associated with that ID, which are you know, held by the UN. They then manage to make their way up to Europe, you know, come in as a refugee. You now have a framework where you can actually check and port all of that information in a consistent way and verify that that person is who they said they were. Um, in a very inexpensive way that doesn't involve running a whole lot of hardware. So for us, that's it's cheapo infrastructure for things that need cheapo infrastructure where you're not going to have a corporate or some other entity going in and saying, you know, oh, we need a, you know, we're going to go pay for a server mainframe to run this. We think that, you know, th there are different kinds of applications where blockchains will be appropriate, and that'll generally be in getting data into and out of places where you don't have servers or reliable internet connections. Yeah, um, uh, clear. Um, especially the applications, or um, uh, you mentioned, um, if you look at uh, the the type of database. Well, actually, you mentioned it's more kind of database. Uh, database you put normally in your uh, company structure and security. Uh, blockchain is splitted, decentral. Uh, there's an uh, how do you say that balance in between uh, in what kind of uh, situation you uh, or state you're in with uh, Arias how do you mean well the security for your own company or uh, servers uh, you have uh, in your own control yeah uh, the distributed database is in control of the community um, how does Iris databases work? So, so when you can permission something, um, you can have, so there's a whole range of appreciation. On the one hand, we can have the thing that we're all familiar with. You can do an Ethereum or a Tendermint or a Bitcoin clone, which is completely open, um, mining rewards, decentralization, you know, proof of work, proof of stake, whatever. If you can write it in code, that's what you're going to get. So that's the one extreme, if that's what you want. Uh, but we already have networks that are used for that, and those networks have large network effects. They have their large communities and the rest of it. At the other extreme, you have one user, one instantiation with all of the permissions for a single chain. So the only reason I can really think of that you would want that is if you need a database that's resistant to a SQL injection attack. That's a good use case for that particular instance. But then you have this whole range in between, between the totally decentralized and the completely locked down centralized one computer. And there, I think, if we read um, it was Nick Zabo's essay from back in December, uh, The Dawn of Trustworthy Computing, and basically he said, what if you have these blockchain networks with 12 people, with 1,000 people, with 10,000 people who use them to address very specific purposes? It may be that those 12 people or 100 people or 10,000 people 
um, are all part of an organization, in which case the organization might manage the chain. And the way that they would do that is, again, through these tiered permissions. Um, so you can, with permissions with Eris, there are four fundamental permissions. One of them is called the Duggar, or, or basically the admin. So Doug is what we call, it's, Doug is the name of the marmot, which is our mascot, um, but it's also a name that we picked out of thin air for the smart contract, which runs an entire Eris system. So a Doug contract goes, or can go, if you choose to put it there, into the Genesis block of a Eris DB. Once it goes into the Genesis block, what you can do is you can say, right, well, we're going to appoint a Duggar who has permissions. That Duggar can then basically, according to that smart contract, authorize, if he wants, any transaction, change any term of the database, amend anything at any time. And this doesn't necessarily mean that he's, so let's say your blockchain's rolling down, that he's going in and plucking data out. It means that if he adds an append transaction to the end of the database, that what happens is the rest of the network acknowledges that as the most current state. So if you say, I've got a block time of 30 seconds, and then your Duggar goes, actually, that's a little too quick. We need to make it a minute. And he sends a command saying, now update. You're, you're not going to have a block time of one minute. The rest of the network will acknowledge that as a valid transaction, because when he sends an API call to the Doug contract signed with his private key, that transaction is added to the end of the chain, and the rest of the network acknowledges the instruction. Next, you have committers, and these are the guys who add blocks. So you can say, in this hypothetical network of 100 people, um, you know, I only want 10 of my friends adding blocks, and then they can have 10 of their friends joining on as well. So these are 10 people I know, I know where to find them, they're processing the transactions, which, because it's not a competitive process, this is done at very low cost. But they have the certainty that everyone who's operating on that system is going to play by those rules. Granted, you have to supervise them, and you have to make sure they're not cheating. But because you know who they are, there's a very strong incentive, unlike with Bitcoin or something else where you don't know, and you have anonymous validators that you can't find. Um, there's a very strong incentive to behave, because if you do cheat, everyone's going to be able to see that you have. Um, beneath that, we have a, a tier of permissions which we call contractors or creators, and those are people who have permissions to author to uh, upload scripts onto the chain. And then you have your fourth set of permissions. Those are transactors, and that's what you might expect in Bitcoin, someone with a Bitcoin balance. So these are guys who are interacting with smart contracts which hold account balances and the rest of it. So you can get as closed or as open as you like with any of those tiers. So you can say, well, you know, I'm uh, on the bank, I'm going to have you know, three super user admins, um, and if they want to exercise their permission, it's a two of three multi-signature. I'm then going to have 100 transaction validators, and we're going to spread those out around the world to make the network resilient um, and make processing resilient. We're then going to have 10 creators who are people who are uploading new contracts to this chain, uploading new functions to this chain. And then we're going to have 100,000 users who are using it as a settlement system a real-time real gross settlement system, effectively. And what you've just done there is you've created this infrastructure for a settlement system, like Bitcoin, which is controlled and which works very reliably over great distances with almost no infrastructure at all. So what you've done, usually this requires a building, a great deal of expertise and, and, and a great deal of labor to administer and electricity and security and the rest of it. Um, with a blockchain, all of a sudden you can cut down on those costs and you can have the system more or less run itself on its own. So our thesis is that that kind of approach, when you build it on a blockchain which can be controlled, is going to have a lot of commercial applications in data management, not necessarily just finance, um, but also in government accountability and other things. Okay. Yeah. So, so you have uh, different communities to uh, create the total security. Yeah. Clear? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, yeah, that's pretty much it. And, you're, and then your, your security calculus changes, so it's really as good as the people who are holding the keys um, at that point or whatever other architecture you put in place, which is very much in line with you know, normal enterprise system design. So... Yeah. It, it, yeah. Good, Tim. So you, question that, to that, um, you, you, you don't have a centralized server, but you do have centralized administrators, so you do have a certain group of people who uh, control the network to some sense. Yeah. How do you prevent, for example, uh, a revocation from an earlier block? Oh, so what? An administrator turns around and says, "We're just going to revoke from this block yeah. back here." Yeah, like what you said, you pluck out a block somewhere from the blockchain, and he instructs the network to uh, take it out, and suddenly somebody doesn't own his house or a plot of land anymore. Mm. Just, uh, That's I, I don't. How do you 
that. How do you prevent that from happening? Uh, you'd have to hard code that particular restriction in, and you would have to limit the administrator's permission to being an append only, um, which I think is how we've written it. I don't, I don't think you can take a block out. I don't think that's an instruction we've come up with yet, but mm -hmm. you, you'd basically limit his permission to do something. Yeah, because with the uh, with the blockchain, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain, that is, uh, to clarify, um, it's it's practically impossible. Because of the work, correct? Because of the work, exactly. Because everybody keeps looking at the longest chain. Yep. Uh, and if somebody plucks one out and it doesn't make sense to the rest of the network, then they will simply refuse to work with that one. Yeah. Uh, so so how does uh, how does your blockchain secure such a, such a feature? You secure it through supervision, just like anything else. I mean, it's how do how do we secure databases at banks today and make sure that they don't erase all our data and erase our bank accounts? They have backups, they have supervision, they have compliance. So that isn't going to go away. The reason you use a blockchain is not to create this you know objective truth of the world. What you're actually using it for in this context is to automate business process. So it's it's a very different security calculus. Um, you're using it for a very different purpose. Um, and you're using it in a very different way. So it, it's you're leveraging certain other aspects, chiefly the automation and the verifiability, but you're not necessarily going for the censorship resistance. Um, you have to, you know, of these different qualities, something has to give in order to get the other qualities. So if you have the administrator, you're trusting the administrator. But let's say it's a public, you know, it's a public chain being run by the government you know, for some particular purpose, presumably people are going to be able to see that. So the benefit you're getting is the transparency of looking and seeing what's happening on this chain. And so every, you know, everyone will notice. They'll say, well, hold on a second. You just took out that block. Where did it go? Um, blockchains are very good transparency machines. So we think that that particular quality is going to mitigate that risk. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah, so Preston, uh, Bitcoin was meant to be this, this trustless protocol that could potentially include the whole world, not being uh, censored by central parties like banks and governments. And that to me, as a, as a monetary um, activist, uh, has always been its biggest charm. You seem to be focusing more now on the old permissioned world, using some of Bitcoin's components. Do you understand this sort of might upset some of the devoted, purest Bitcoin users? And, and how do you deal, deal with that kind of feedback? Uh, we know it upsets them <laughs> because they let us know about it very loudly. <laughs> but I don't think I, I want it to be politically correct. So. It, it's a very, it's a complex subject, right? It, it's not it's not so simple. Um, Bitcoin. Uh, we can touch on Bitcoin itself in a minute. But I, let's say you have a communications protocol where you're using the protocol as just that a protocol, and then you have different databases being controlled or blockchains which are mutually intelligible, being run by different communities in different places to address a very specific thing, such as peer-to-peer -peer payments um, or, or something like that. This allows people to build their own infrastructure and then agree open standards with other communities with whom they want to communicate and agree on states of data which they share. So it's not necessarily that when you go back to permissions, yes, the structure of an individual blockchain changes, but you can now have 100 million of them. So and when you, every time you create one of these blockchains, what you're doing is you're getting a group of people off some of the stacks. You're getting them out of web servers. You're getting them running their own data infrastructure, which is designed to serve their purpose, which does not give their data away to anybody because they're using their own, inf their own hard drive space and their own processing power to run the interaction. So I, I get the criticism because, yes, people go, oh, God, you know, uh, you know, corporates are, and governments are going to use these blockchains. Yes, they will. Like, yeah. So, so like basically they, you're saying that Bitcoin, Bitcoin is be your own bank and, and Eris is be your own blockchain. Eris is be your own server. Yeah. Eris is be your own server. Build your own blockchain. Be your own data management. Yeah. Um, but you're um, also a fellow at the libertarian think tank, Adam Smith Institute in London. So what is your, just setting your commercial interests aside, what is your personal ideal society that everyone is KYC'd and tracked by large central parties or something more and much more distributed, decentralized? Um, I can see, how to put it, I don't really think about that too much. To be honest with you, the reason we designed Eris the way we did is because I looked at regulatory law. I, I used to be a, a securities lawyer. And well, like, you're doing philosophy, right? You're, you're well, part of libertarian yeah, I know, but like, and, but like AML KYC is just like the dullest thing in the universe. Uh, so I found it very. But do you think it's a good thing or not? Do you think that people should be KYC for every uh, every cent they spend? No, I think it's a human right to be anonymous. 
Um, and I think there should be facilities for people to be anonymous. And I think that people should have control over their data. Um, That's one of the reasons you're going to leave England. You guys, uh, you're based, well, you're based in several locations, but your legal entity is incorporated in the UK, right? But the, you've been tweeting that you're going to move your um, headquarters based on some recent um, regulation in the UK. Can you elaborate on that? We're negotiating a lease in the United States now. Um, and uh, and I'm actually talking to you from New York. We, you know, I got up and left from England. Um, yeah, England. It's but before we get onto that, I think more to the point. Um, a blockchain which is controlled by 15 people, 100 people, a thousand people, um, is giving them the ability to talk to each other without for free, more or less, because they're using their own equipment to do it, um, without having to rely on somebody else. And you know, they say when you get given a service for free, you are the product. Um, in the case of a Google and a Facebook and anything like that, that's absolutely correct. In the case of a blockchain, the, that's not the case. I mean, a blockchain is just a way of organizing data. So we kind of look at it as, as like the blueprints to a new kind of tool, like the blueprints to a hammer that you've just put up on the village square. Once you know how to do something in blockchain world, you can repeat it a, bil you know, a billion times. Once someone figures out a really good messaging protocol, um, it's peer-to-peer -peer and involves blockchains for particular types of financial transactions or bank in a box, for example. You suddenly lowered the barriers to entry to banking because you know what the coding, you know, what the coded parameters are that you need to set. And then when you push a button, you have a bank. So we think that the proliferation of this kind of a database as, a, as an industrial automation tool uh, is actually going to be really useful and is going to give people a lot of their privacy back. Um, so, but that you know, the power to do so is does not rest in our hands. You know, we sit there, we design the open source database. It's going to be people who design applications which serve their needs, which are distributed, which don't need servers, which are very predictable, um, and that's what we think these databases are really good at. If that makes sense. Right, and then to to get back to the final point uh, before we wrap up about um, mm -hmm. you guys moving to the states. At the same time, we see Sapo moving to Switzerland from the states. Uh, there seems to be a hub in Switzerland, and in the Netherlands, there's a lot of activity going on too. So, what? Why the states, and not Switzerland or the Netherlands, or? Uh, so, where we're taking? Well, firstly, Casey and I are both Americans, so it was pretty convenient to just say, right, okay, in in this instance, um, you know, the states is is a good destination for us. But just by way of further background for for the viewers, the UK has uh, said they will introduce a new bill, which is called the Investigatory Powers Bill. Um, eventually the Investigatory Powers Act. And what that does is, is two things. Uh, the first, we believe, um, on the basis of press reports, is that they're going to attempt to mandate state backdoors into cryptography. Uh, being a blockchain firm that uses various other cryptographic protocols uh, as part of our work, um, this is obviously completely unacceptable, and we can't do business in the UK if that happens. The second one is that they're going to mandate that all telecommunications service providers uh, retain all user data for all of their users for a minimum of 12 months after the user has transmitted that information. So you're looking at something like every WhatsApp message you send, every Facebook message you send, every email you send, every text message you send, um, every you know, service you use, every Snapchat, you know, everything you can possibly imagine um, has to be stored, retained, and then the government on request has to be able to access that. So they will have more or less a complete picture of everything that has happened on the internet in the United Kingdom uh, minute by minute, blow by blow, over the course of the previous year from any point in time. Um, our worry about that is that a blockchain is itself a telecommunication system, and arguably every single user is a provider of that telecommunication system. If not an admin, then certainly, you know, you know certainly the individual users could be viewed, a full node could be viewed as a, um, as a operator of that system because you can reproduce the whole system from one copy. So our view is that if we're going to be a blockchain as a service provider, uh, the regulatory cost of compliance is going to be extremely high. We One web service provider, a web hosting provider, said that compliance will cost them 30 million pounds uh, up front before the law you know, even comes into effect just to get ready for it. So, How much uh, funding do you guys have as, as a company? Not nearly 30 million, I'll tell you that much. Um, I wish we had 30 million. 
But um, but yeah, I mean that's those are the kinds of sums that are involved. A and B. I don't want to live in a country where where everything that everyone does at all times. And yeah, arguably the U.S. does it too. But in the U.S., you still need to get a warrant if you want to access it and you want to bring someone before a court. In Britain, that's no longer the case. Council officials can get this data. So it, you know, for any reason they they choose. So so yeah, I don't want to live like that. I don't want to live in a country that's like that. Nobody else should either. Um, and you know we haven't seen you know Britain's by a margin of 20 to one uh, polls have indicated that they don't think the government needs this power. 50 percent of the population has said that they would use the internet less if this particular piece of legislation came into force. Um, and the government just simply hasn't listened to what its people are saying. And in typical British fashion, they're muddling through. Um, and and there's, paying, no, there's no Rand Paul to filibuster or to fight it in the no, UK. They, they need what well, you know what they need. They need 10 MPs. 10 Tory MPs, and this is supposed to be the party of freedom, mind you. Um, you know, the libertarian think tank, the Adam Smith Institute, invented Thatcherism um, back in the day. That, so if you think about it that way, um, you need 10 MPs to defect, well, 10 people to stand up and say no. And if they do that, then this bill dies. And um, and so we, yeah, we stood up uh, and we said we're not going to, you know, we're not going to live like this. Uh, a, a couple of other firms have stood up and said we don't want this. Um, and we know at least one Tory MP opposes it, which means we've got nine to go. And then the other uh, opposition parties need to get their stuff together and, um, and, and object. But if you can do that, nine people is all it will really take to stop this bill from becoming law. And I hope that happens desperately because, um, because it's a really very draconian and, uh, and illiberal piece of legislation. Okay, interesting. Well, good luck with that. Um, Tim, uh, you have more questions before we wrap up, or uh, Patrick? No, my last question was just been asked by you, so. Hmm? Good, and Patrick? Uh, no, no further questions. No, thank you. Uh, maybe better you can. Um, you're, I can see you right now. Just see your avatar, but um, yeah, it's French. Yeah, too bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit, Patrick. You're from Bitcoin um, ColdStorage.com, right? Can you maybe like in, in one minute? Can you explain what you what you guys do? Yeah. Uh, at, at first, of course, explain what Bitcoin and the blockchain is, what it can do for uh, money transfer, and also the security of it. And uh, we help companies to um, uh, obtain uh, security within their own uh, business processes um, and also for new product product development. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's that, it's that secure that you, you're not even visible. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll try to put my camera a on and off, but it uh, does not uh, gain on. No. Okay. Well, um, thanks, uh, Preston, um, so much for, for joining. Um, and stick around for after the show, and um, I'd like to uh, ask the viewers to like this video and to subscribe. That's the only thing you have to do. Of course, you can donate too, but it's, it's really more about trying to grow the channel. So uh, thanks so much, Preston, and also thanks, uh, Tim and Patrick, for being on the show. And thank you very much for the invitation. Oh yeah, one, where can people find you, Preston? Maybe just uh, some oh, of yeah, your, so, uh, um, Just find us at erisindustries.com. Um, and yeah, and then basically Reddit, that's R, Eris Industries, uh, IRC, uh, Freenode, uh, it's Eris Industries. It's, it's, Eris almost Industries. Impossible. it's almost impossible not to find you. Basically. Yeah, no, it's, I know it's really hard to remember, but just type in Eris Industries and you'll be able to get a hold of us one way or another. Okay. Well, thanks so much, and uh, let's talk again in the future. Right.